20,000 employees lost their jobs, and 2 billion pensions were reduced to ashes. Company executives sold stocks crazily but encouraged employees to keep buying, and even invested pension funds in company stocks. But when companies went bankrupt, executives easily walked away with billions of dollars, while investors lost their money and tens of thousands of employees lost their jobs. This company is the energy giant Enron, which was once the seventh largest company in the United States. It took 16 years to accumulate the company's assets from 10 billion to 65 billion, with as many as 21,000 employees, but it took only 24 days to bring the company into bankruptcy. Today we will take a look at one of the top 10 bankruptcy cases in American history, the Enron bankruptcy case. Enron had the top traders in the United States, and they held the future energy and electricity prices. Enron was also one of the largest corporate financial backers, supporting Bush's campaign for the first term. Of course, neither the president nor Enron admitted that any interests have arisen between them. Enron founder Ray was a proponent of government deregulation, and he foresaw deregulation of the energy market, especially the tightly controlled natural gas industry. So he actively lobbied in Washington to loosen the policy, advocating that the government loosen restrictions on businessmen. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. The societies which have achieved the most spectacular, broad-based economic progress in the shortest period of time are not the most tightly controlled, not necessarily the biggest in size, or the wealthiest in natural resources. No, what unites them all is their willingness to believe in the magic of the marketplace. Government deregulation, allowing natural gas prices to fluctuate with the market, prompted Ray to found Enron in 1985. By merging a vast network of natural gas pipelines, Ray realized that Enron had an opportunity. Of course, Ray was not the only one who thinks of this. Oil practitioners in Texas had also discovered this, and they try their best to keep the government from interfering in the energy industry. Ray had a particularly close relationship with Bush Sr., who helped Enron secure billions of dollars in government grants, and he also helped Ray lobby around when Bush Jr. was governor of Texas. This is also the closest family and enterprise relationship in American history, but Enron's oil scandal almost caused Enron to lose trust. In 1987, two traders bet on the rise and fall of oil prices for Enron. While oil trading was like gambling, Enron's oil deals were rarely lost. The two traders falsified profits and destroyed daily transaction records, and at the same time used overseas accounts to make false accounts to transfer profits to their accounts, and even exceeded their authority to conduct gambling transactions. But Ray did not fire them, because this is the company's only profitable project, and Ray even encouraged them to expand their careers and make more money for the company. In Ray's eyes, as long as he could make money, he could do anything, but good luck will always run out. Two months later, the two traders had lost all of Enron's oil reserves, a loss of more than $90 million. In the end, Enron sent the two traders to prison. The next problem was how to find the next profitable project. At this time, the king of ideas Jeff appeared. Jeff came up with a brilliant idea to turn energy into a financial instrument, that is, securitization, which can be traded like stocks and bonds. Since 1992, Enron has been North America's largest buyer and seller of natural gas. Jeff saw the future of shaping a new industry. He proposed the condition of joining Enron, which was to allow him to adopt the current market accounting principle. Anderson, one of the former top five international accounting firms, endorsed him, and the SEC also approved it. The current market accounting principle is to allow enterprises to settle future profits on the same day. As far as the outside market was concerned, Enron's profits were decided by itself, which was very subjective and easy to operate. For example, if they want to sell the power of the power plant, and sell at X dollars per watt in 10 years, then they can calculate this part of the profit into today's account, and they can set this X at will. CEO Jeff firmly believed that human beings are driven by greed and competition. He thoroughly implemented natural selection in Enron or frankly speaking, the last elimination system. The rating was divided into five levels. The employees on the fifth level would be fired. And those who were on the first level can get millions of year-end bonuses. To this end, Enron had to cut 15% of its manpower every year. Under this kind of corporate culture, Enron's traders were extremely ferocious, like gang leaders in the market, and they had also become the company's most profitable force. One of the executives, Lewis, was Jeff's most important executive. He assisted Enron in establishing early energy transactions and was in charge of Enron's energy service company, which sold energy to end customers. Jeff called Lewis an intercontinental ballistic missile. 
Lewis was only interested in two things, one was money and the other was strippers. Whenever the company's operating figures hit the target, Lewis would lose interest in the company, and then he sold all his Enron shares, taking away 250 million US dollars. After leaving office, he became the second largest landowner in Colorado. Although the total loss of his department exceeded 1 billion, Enron managed to hide it. As internet technology stocks continue to soar, and the US stock market continues to hit new record highs, as long as people with a little money around them suddenly started rushing into the stock market, no one thought that investing in the stock market would lose money. The stock price kept going up, and Enron was clearly aware of the stock market operation mode. As long as it caught the thoughts of analysts and exceeded analysts' expectations, the stock price would have continued to rise. As I said earlier, Enron used the current marketing price accounting principle, and its profit figures could be created at will. Therefore, Enron would always exceed analysts' expectations, and its stock price would continue to hit new highs. Then Enron played a trick, the senior managers raised the stock price, and then transferred the allotment of millions. Enron employees got most of their compensation in stock, and everyone expected the stock price to go up, and everyone was intoxicated by the company's stock price. Enron focused on stock prices and more on a public relations campaign to convince the investment community. Enron was different and innovative. Under the banner of stable growth, Enron estimated that the company will grow by 10% to 15% per year. On paper alone, Enron was soaring, but in fact, it was losing money everywhere. Enron exploited natural gas all over the world and spent billions to operate it. For example, it built a power plant in India but ignored the high electricity bills that Indians could not afford. In the end, the power plant was abandoned and lost 1 billion, but Enron executives still have millions of dividends, because they have already credited the profits after the plant was built into the company's account. Then Enron acquired the Portland Power Company, which enabled Enron to enter the power generation industry. Portland Power was on the West Coast, and Enron was able to cut in the newly opened electricity market in California making Enron the largest wholesaler and retailer of electricity and natural gas in the United States. Enron's stock continued to soar, making Enron employees begin to buy Enron's stock with their own money and even retirement funds, which was one of the reasons why Enron's stock continued to rise. We invest all of our 401k in Enron stock, absolutely. Don't you guys agree? <laughs> <laughs> Although Enron's financial report was full of doubts, analysts overwhelmingly evaluate Enron's stock as a strong stock, because all analysts who questioned Enron's stock price were fired. Enron once issued an investment entrustment case worth 50 million US dollars to Merrill Lynch, and once it was settled, the securities company would never hear bad news again. Enron's stock price continued to soar, but Enron kept losing money, and they didn't book the losses. Enron continued to throw out one major plan after another, such as securitizing the bandwidth for transmitting information, taking out idle bandwidth for trading, and Enron created a futures market for buying and selling bandwidth. Then it was reported that it was cooperating with Blockbuster on movie services so Enron's stock price rose by 34% in two days. Enron announced that the relevant technology has been developed and will enter the market test at the end of the year, and the business is progressing very smoothly. In fact, Enron Enron did not solve the technical problem at all, and the cooperation with Blockbuster ended thereupon. However, Enron had calculated the estimated future profits into its own account, although in fact, it did not earn a penny. By the end of 2000, Enron had no way to improve its bandwidth business. The company began to be in turmoil, and executives began to sell company stocks. Before Enron collapsed, founder Ray sold 300 million, and CEO Jeff sold 200 million. At the end of 2000, the internet bubble began to burst, and the entire Wall Street was looking for new targets. Enron's performance in the financial report still looked good, and it was even selected as the most innovative company in the United States. Enron was selected as one of the most respected companies by Fortune magazine for six consecutive years. However, some investors have begun to question Enron's secret operation, asking where their income comes from and where their profits come from. In fact, Enron had been in the red year after year, but the financial report showed a profit. This was the masterpiece of Andy, the company's financial officer. Andy concealed the fact that the company owed 30 billion. First, the stock price continued to rise. With more and more fraud, Andy created a bunch of shell companies and transferred all of Enron's debts to these shell companies, so that there was no investor could discover Enron's liabilities and losses. Then, Enron's board approved Andy to set up the LJM fund, so that Enron could transfer huge debts to LJM and inflate assets and income. Andy found several well-known companies to invest in LJM funds, used Enron's stock as a bet, and used Enron's stock as collateral for many transactions. In the case of an estimated profit of 20 times, 96 banks invested in LJM funds, including Chase, Citigroup, 
Merrill Lynch, Deutsche Bank, and First Boston. In this way, Enron tied the investment bank with itself, making Enron's fraud a collective corruption. Lawyers, accountants, and bank investors should have discovered and stopped, but they chose to participate in the fraud and put money in their own pockets. Anison would receive a fee of $1 million per week to help Enron conceal the financial report audit, and Enron's law firm could also get a similar fee. As long as Enron was alive, all participants could get a share. So it was a scam from top to bottom. The bank knew that Enron was playing tricks, and Merrill Lynch helped Enron to make false accounts and turn the loans into assets to buy Enron. When Enron Energy Services Company faced a loss of $500 million, it made a more inhumane operation, which was to use the energy crisis to collect money. Enron had 26,000 miles of power lines in California, which were long enough to circle the Earth. However, the first continent of the United States experienced power outages for two consecutive days. Originally, it only needed 30,000 megawatts of electricity in December, and California's power supply capacity is fully 45,000 megawatts of electricity. Enron became ecstatic when ongoing blackouts hit California, wondering if energy prices would go up. California implements an open energy system, that is, prices change with the market. Enron transmitted California's cheap electricity to other states. When California's electricity supply was insufficient, it would cause prices to rise, and then they would transmit the store back to California to earn the difference. They arbitraged 1 million to 2 million a day from California. Enron continually sold electricity to outsiders, and traders worked every 12 hours to buy and sell electricity in the West. Enron knew the power supply in California, so they would raise the price at any time. If they didn't accept it, then the power will be cut off. Electricity prices skyrocketed as back-to-back -back blackouts hit across California. What was even more infuriating was that Enron would artificially create electricity shortages, such as shutting down several power plants to make the power supply insufficient, or make some excuses to say that the power plants were undergoing maintenance, and then the power would be cut off, so the price of electricity would rise, and they would make a profit from it. To put it bluntly, it was to set prices as their wish, and people had to buy it. Anyway, Enron was in the charge of electricity and you have to pay whatever it wants. Through such means, traders earned $2 billion for Enron, and other energy companies followed Enron's example, which raised electricity prices in California. On the other hand, enterprises could not afford the high electricity bills and closed down one after another, and California residents also suffered from power outages at any time. It caused all kinds of difficulties in life, and even a fire broke out in California because of the high temperature. The main line caught fire, and the line was overloaded. But traders were excited about it, and electricity prices would continue to rise. No one would feel unethical, and no one would feel uncomfortable about it. These traders would get millions of bonuses from it. The annual power crisis cost California $30 billion, and when the governor of California asked the federal government to regulate, I know full well my administration's belief that price controls will not solve the problem. His view was that the federal government really shouldn't get involved, this is California's problem. Enron lobbied the federal government not to limit the electricity price in California. The committee also refused to intervene, since the chairman of the Federal Regulatory Council was recommended by Ray. In the end, under the pressure of the Senate, the JMC demanded that regional electricity prices be set on the line, ending the energy crisis. One of the reasons for the resignation of the governor of California is the energy crisis. The later governor of California is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Enron's financial game finally failed. Enron's stock price began to fall, and CEO Jeff also announced his resignation. With Jeff's departure, Enron began to suffer a major earthquake. Even though Ray wanted to stabilize the situation and constantly released good news to the outside world, Enron's fraud was gradually revealed. The chief financial officer's fraud was reported, and Enron announced the reorganization of major financial reports. As Enron's accounting firm, Anison began to destroy Enron's files. On October 23, it destroyed a ton of documents. Andy was pushed out as a scapegoat, but no one believes Ray and Jeff were innocent. Chase, Morgan, and Citigroup with billions of loans, accounting firms, and law firms had also been involved. On December 2, 2001, Enron declared bankruptcy. Before declaring bankruptcy, the executives cashed out their stocks and left the market, but lured employees to continue to increase their positions, and all employees were dismissed. The bottom employees never thought that Enron would go bankrupt, and suddenly the company disappeared, and these employees had nothing. We all had some really nice looking 401ks and pensions and but it peaked and then it just started going down and went lower and lower and lower. The peak I had about 348000 and I sold it all for $1,200 was what I got for it when it was done. When Enron's stock plummeted, 
All employees' pension accounts were frozen. And this was not the most infuriating thing. The most infuriating thing was that they learned that the executives sold 1 billion shares. And these bottom employees worked hard in the end but got nothing. Seven weeks after Enron went bankrupt, strategy officer Cliff committed suicide, and financial officer Andy pleaded guilty. The court confiscated his 23 million assets and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Shareholders sued Enron for a claim of up to 20 billion from its bank. Ray was also prosecuted for fraud. 20,000 people lost their jobs and medical insurance. The average severance pay was only $4,500, while executive bonuses totaled $55 million. In 2001, employees lost 1.2 billion pension funds, and retired employees lost 2 billion pension funds. Enron executives sold 116 million shares, three California traders pleaded guilty to fraud, four Merrill Lynch executives were convicted of fraud, and CEO Jeff was sentenced to 24 years. Ray eventually died of a heart attack. It is difficult for ordinary people to keep their eyes open, and even when the bottom from the top are faked, it is very difficult for outsiders to recognize. When we stake our fortunes on these companies, it often creates tragedy. In these amoral companies, they turn everything into a tool for profit. For these company executives, the most important thing is not what the market provides, but how to pocket the money. For ordinary people, it means being cautious. Don't be blinded by the news and prosperity in front of you, and don't pin your future hopes on others. What you see is the profit, and what they see is your principal. Well, subscribe to watch more movies about money, and see you next time.